in Philippians this morning. We've been, well, I've been in Philippians a lot in the Malachi. God and I have been having a discussion about Malachi. You don't have an argument with God, do you? You always have a discussion. And uh, anyways, we'll be back in Malachi, I think, next week. But this morning, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Let's pray. Father God, help us to think in a way that would bring honor and glory to you, in a way that would bless us. Lord, we recognize that we can't praise you. We can't be joyful and happy when anxieties and cares of the world crowd into our minds and, and we're thinking in ways that don't help us. We're thinking in ways that harm us and that tear us down and that defeat us. Lord, help us to guard our minds, help us to train our minds, Lord, so that we can think on those good things that this scripture talks about, so that we can be blessed, and so that we can be happy, joyful. We're going to ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you. But for me, Philippians is one of my favorites. You may have noticed because I preach a lot on Philippians. Uh, and I know we've been a lot there in there recently. But I think God has something for us from, from these verses this morning. Uh, this begins with a very strong sentence. Rejoice in the Lord always. It would be easier for us if that word always was, wasn't there, wouldn't it? I can rejoice when I'm happy and things are going well, but, you know, give me a break. Sometimes it's not all that great. You know, I can hear people reading that word. Surely it can't mean that we're to rejoice in the Lord all the time, no matter what. And Paul, I think, is reading our thoughts here, it seems. And he responds, again, I will say, rejoice. In other words, I really meant it. Rejoice in the Lord in every situation, whatever the challenge. And again, I'll tell you, I mean it, rejoice. Have you ever noticed how many people offer you advice when you're in a time of adversity? Many times they're not facing troubles themselves or they've never <coughs> even faced troubles what you're going through, but they'll readily say, you know, just pray. You just need to pray. Uh, when you don't feel like praying, or, or just take the next step when you can barely walk, you know, step out in faith. That's what you got to do. Step out in faith. But you're like, no, I've stubbed my toe too many times here, here recently. I don't feel like that. And, and this advice is, is from Paul, who at this point we need to understand he was in prison. He was in chains. He wasn't planting churches or encouraging others, but he's falsely accused. He's confined. He's limited. And yet he wrote this letter to the Philippians, and the theme of this letter seems to be Joel. Does that get your attention? You know, this guy in jail, in chains, and he's telling other people about Joel. First thing I, I think he says here is don't retreat. How can we rejoice always? Verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Some synonyms for gentleness would be big-heartedness, kindness, 
charitableness, magnanimity, generosity. The natural human tendency is to withdraw. But here, Paul's telling us not to become reclusive in harboring, you know, helplessness, hopelessness, but inclusive in displaying gentleness. Notice he says to display gentleness to all, everybody. Paul knows we need others around to keep us from focusing completely on our own problems. How can we display gentleness when we're hopeless? Well, this leads us to the next phrase. The Lord is near, or the Lord is at hand. In studying the Bible, you'll discover whatever God asks of you, He'll enable you to do so through His power. So when you face adversity, don't give up. Don't isolate yourself. Keep others around. Rely on God's empowering to display gentleness rather than despair. Secondly, Paul tells us to pray. Verse 6 begins, be anxious. That word anxious could also be worried. Be worried for nothing. The verb is present tense. We're, we're not to live in a continual state of worry. It's don't be worried. Don't, that shouldn't be who you are, a worrier. There are times when we ought to be concerned for sure, but Paul is telling us to not live in this constant state of anxiety. And this leads us to that next phrase, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice that phrase with thanksgiving. When things fall apart in our lives, we tend to lose that thankful spirit, that thankful perspective. Paul tells us it's all right to bring our request to God, but we should do it with thanksgiving. Thanking God for what He's already accomplished and what He's going to accomplish. He uses a Greek word for thanksgiving, which in its root means grace. Thanksgiving is an appropriate response to God's grace. Even during difficulty, we're, we're recipients of the undeserved favor and blessings of God. And so we're to thank God in that same spirit. I don't deserve this. I'm asking for it, but I know I don't deserve it. And yet you give me those things I, I don't really deserve. You've given me forgiveness, life. When one of her sons was living a wild, dangerous life, Ruth Graham Bell found herself torn apart by worry. While traveling abroad, she suddenly awoke in the middle of the night worrying about this son. This current of worry, she said, surged through her like an electric shock. She lay in bed and tried to pray, but she suffered from what you might call galloping anxiety. That's where one fear piles on top of another fear piles upon another. She looked at the clock and it was around three o'clock in the morning. She was exhausted and yet she knew she'd be unable to go back to sleep. Suddenly, it seemed like the Lord was saying to her, quit studying the problems and start studying the promises. So she turned the light on, got out of the Bible. And the first verses that came to her were these in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. As she read those words, she, she suddenly realized that the missing ingredient in her prayers had been thanksgiving. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So she put down her Bible and she spent time worshiping God for who and what He is. And she later wrote about that experience, I began to thank God for giving me this one I love so dearly in the first place. I even thanked Him for the difficult spots which He had taught me so much. And you know what happened? It was as if someone turned on the light in my mind and heart, and little fears and worries that had been nibbling away in the darkness, like mice and cockroaches, hurriedly scuttled for cover. That was when I learned that worship and worry can't live in the same heart. They're mutually exclusive. 
Are you worrying too much? Well, you need to worship God some. And the anxiety and the worry will go away. Then finally, Paul tells us to stay focused. Listen to what he says here in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. What are you dwelling on? What is your mind thinking about? Can it be characterized as being true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellence, worthy of praise? If the things you're thinking about cannot be characterized by any of those words, you're thinking about the wrong stuff. You mean? You need to change what you're thinking about. Change your mind. The battle for joy takes place in your mind. We easily become self-centered, blaming ourselves, blaming others, trying to figure out what we could have done differently. You may feel trapped in the past, overwhelmed by the present, anxious about the future. The Bible encourages us to stay focused. But how? How do we stay focused? And on what do we stay focused? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it says, that, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. In other words, it isn't enough just to quote a verse of Scripture. It needs to be memorized, meditated on, repeated, until it captivates our minds and grips our souls and changes what we're thinking about and what we're dwelling on. We win the battle of joy in our minds by focusing on the holy, wholesome Scriptures. Paul who understood difficult situations probably better than anybody, told us to always rejoice. He said, don't retreat. Let your big-heartedness be known to everyone. God is near to help you. Pray with thanksgiving and stay focused, allowing wholesome thinking to dominate your mind. The result, verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God offers us His peace, a peace the Bible describes as undescribable. You know, it can't be explained. Uh, and, and it prevails in all circumstances. The same God who offers this unexplainable peace offers His presence. Certainly we can say with Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. There was a happy Christian one time who met a peddler, an Irish peddler. He said to him, it's a grand thing to be saved. I said the peddler, it is, but I, I think something is equally as good as that. What can you possibly think is equally equal to salvation, he asked. The companionship of the man who has saved me was the reply. When we know that, when, when we can rejoice with John and say, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Realizing that, I think we can say with Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. But let me demand a reality check for us here this morning. Is that really where we are? I think some of us would have to confess, well, I'm kind of happy, kind of rejoiceful, but there are those things that are going on, you know? I'd like to think that I'm always rejoicing. I wish it to be so, but we all know that wishing doesn't make things so. The older I get, the more I'm learning that prayer is not a monologue. It's a dialogue, amen? 
It's a conversation between us and God. I'm, I'm discovering more and more that the real need in my life is not for God to hear from me, but for me to hear from Him. You know, when I share my heart and, and what's on my mind, and when you know, I then just sit still and say, now what do you think about that, God? And, and He says stuff to me. And I find that as I walk and drive or get on my knees, if, if I'll pray a phrase or two and, and then just rest and be quiet, the Lord can bring specific scriptures to my mind or will write His will on my heart concerning how I ought to pray. But if I pray sentence after paragraph after page and then say, okay, that wraps it up. You know, prayer time's done for today. I really miss it when I, you know, when it's just all me talking and all me telling God all this stuff. I know that even that kind of prayer has power. You know, any prayer is better than no prayer. But I, I want to suggest to you this morning that if you'll learn to pause from time to time and listen in prayer, the Lord might even show you how to believe on behalf of another person and uh, at least how to pray specifically concerning any given situation. Let's let's jump away for just a second here from Philippians and consider a situation in the Old Testament. Hezekiah was a godly man and a good king. He loved the Lord and had a deep walk with Him. In other words, he was a man close to God. Nevertheless, he found himself in, in, a, in a big mess when, when he heard that Sennacherib his, and his million-man army, uh, the Assyrian army, were marching toward Jerusalem, you know, these guys were the inventors of the siege strategy, the battering ram, and, and the Assyrians had been unbeatable in battle by anybody they faced, unparalleled in their brutality. So what is Hezekiah going to do? He, these guys are coming after him. First, he tries to solve his problem financially by attempting to bribe Sennacherib with the gold of the temple. That plan, of course, backfired because the sight of the gold only increased Sennacherib's determination to plunder Jerusalem. Hezekiah's next plan was to build an alliance with Egypt. You know, he said to them, you guys have horses and soldiers and military might at your disposal. Ally with us because if Sennacherib beats us, you're next. At that moment, Isaiah the prophet comes on the scene and thunders a prophecy in the ears of Hezekiah. <coughs> Isaiah 30 says, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine, and make an alliance but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt, for thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. In other words, what God wants from anyone who's in crisis, anyone in an hour of need, is to return to Him, to wait on Him, to be quiet before Him. I, I, I wonder if there are good men and women sitting here this morning who feeling pressure relationally or vocationally, pressure in ministry or financially. People who are saying, help me, you know, help me to this counselor, save me to some other group. When all along the Lord would say, first and foremost, come to me. I don't have time to pray, we say. You know, I'm late for my counseling appointment. I need to get there. I don't have time to seek the Lord. I've got to strip the temple of its gold and pay off Sennacherib. Yet all the while, Paul says, we're not to be anxious. We're not to be full of care about anything. His, however, is not merely a don't worry, be happy kind of a maxim like we hear today on the radio. He goes on to tell us, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. Prayer refers just to general communion with God. Supplication is talking about specific requests. 
when you ask God for something. Therefore, Paul is saying, be anxious about nothing, pray about everything, give thanks for anything. You know, that you might be thinking, well, that's easy for Paul to say. His prayers were always answered the way he wanted. Really? Check out what he said to the Romans here in Romans 15, verse 30. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. So as he comes to the end of, of this letter to the Romans, he says, pray with me first that I may be delivered from my enemies in Jerusalem. Second, pray that my service may be accepted by the Christians. And finally, that I may come to you at Rome with joy. What happened? Well, he was captured by his enemies in Jerusalem. His ministry was not readily accepted by the saints. And the only way that he made it to Rome was as a prisoner. So here's the deal. God can say yes to my prayers and God can say no. Either way, it's an answer. How many, many times I've said, you know, okay, God, here's my request. Only to see that down the road, what takes place is a whole lot better than what I asked for. If your child asks for bread, which of you would give him a stone? Jesus asked. Or if he wants a fish, who of you would give him a scorpion? And sometimes we think we're asking for salmon, but the Lord recognizes that that's a scorpion for you. Or sometimes we cry for bread, but the Lord sees that as a boulder, and he loves us too much to give us something that would hurt us. So what are we to do? Well, we're to make our request and then rest in God's peace, a peace that passes our understanding. We can't explain it. We say, Lord, I choose not to wring my hands and try to figure out how I can strip the temple or ally with Egypt. I choose to return to you, to rest in you, worry about nothing, pray about everything, and to be thankful for anything you decide to do. And what happens may blow your mind. Ask Hezekiah. Seek the Lord, Isaiah told him. And Hezekiah did just that. And even as Sennacherib continued to march, things looked, things looked pretty ominous when suddenly he, he heard of a new war breaking out. And so Sennacherib diverted his troops to an uprising northeast of Jerusalem. But that didn't keep Sennacherib's general, Rabshakeh, from firing off a letter to Hezekiah that essentially said, if you think we're through with you, you're mistaken. We will not stop from destroying Jerusalem, he says over in 2 Kings 18. Ever get a letter, something like that? You know, intimidating letter, threatening letter, <laughs> disheartening. Maybe it says something like, service will be suspended in five days. You don't pay the bill. Or the pink slip that says, we regret to inform you. This time, however, Hezekiah didn't say, oh no, what am I going to do? Who can I call? Ghostbusters weren't around in those days. No, having heard this word from Isaiah, Hezekiah took Rabshakeh's letter and he went into the temple and he opened it before the Lord and he said, Lord, I'm giving this to you, essentially. As he began to worship the one who dwells above, the one who is greater than all, he gave it to God. Here on earth, things can seem pretty big. Bigger than we are. Our mountains tower 29,028 feet above us. And the depths of the Mariana Trench plunge 36,198 feet, I'm told. But from space, if you look at our planet, it looks perfectly smooth. In, in fact, if our earth was shrunk to the size of a bowling ball, you know, a brand new unused bowling ball without the little holes in it, uh, it, would, it would have, that bowling ball would have more grooves and valleys and peaks than would our earth. It's all a matter of perspective. When like Hezekiah, you get above the situation, 
suddenly the problems that loom so large and threaten so menacingly take on an entirely different dimension proportionally because as the story goes on, Isaiah comes to Hezekiah saying, the Lord has spoken that not one person in Jerusalem shall be harmed. In fact, not one arrow shall enter the city. Now the Assyrians did indeed come back to fight. As was their custom, they surrounded the city. All it would have taken to nullify Isaiah's prophecy was for one soldier to take one arrow and fire it over the wall, but that didn't happen. The Assyrians set up their camp around the city, 185,000 soldiers strong. But that night an angel of the Lord came and smote the Assyrians before even one man could string his bow to fire an arrow. 185,000 men were wiped out in a way Hezekiah could have never orchestrated or predicted, in a way no counselor could have directed, no author of any book of fiction would have ever devised. That's the way of the Lord. So what does he say to you and to me today? Take your cares and turn them into prayer. As I've already alluded to, we, we all know this, but... Do we do it? Do we leave our anxieties and our concerns before the Lord? Or even as, as we look at these words in, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, are we wondering, you know, who can we get to help us? You know, who can help us face this problem we're in? Right now, I want to ask you to find a scrap of paper, anything you can write on. There are pencils here and there. You may need to share pencils. Write whatever it is that concerns you today. It could be a relational stress, could be ministry related, financial, family. After you write it down, spread it before the Lord and say, Lord, this is it. This is what's on my plate. This is what is getting my go. Like Hezekiah, I hear the footsteps and hoofbeats of the mighty Assyrians headed my way. It sounds like I'm in for destruction. These things weigh me down, Lord. Free me of this burden as I lift it to you. I want to ask you to do that today. The next time you're in this kind of situation that you're in, do it for that too. Write it down. And then when you leave, Throw that away somewhere. Find a trash can. You know, light it on fire. You know, whatever you want to do to it to get rid of it after you've you know prayed about it. It's done with. And I I, I think you will see <laughs> the salvation of the Lord just like Hezekiah saw. You'll see His peace that passes all understanding. Well, we're going to stand together and, and sing a, a final song. I'm going to ask all of us to uh, stand, ask the musicians to come forward. If someone needs to make a decision for the Lord, I'll be up front here to receive you. But all of us, let's commit to the Lord to turn all the things that bother us over to Him. To get those things out of our minds so that we never think about them again. And so that, you know, only those honorable, true, pure, good things are what we think about. From now on, every, every time you have an issue, take it to God. Write it down and say, Lord, this is yours. I can't, I, you know, I don't know how to handle this other than to trust you with it. Throw it away because God has it. Let's commit to it today as we sing. Thank <laughs> you.